Dear America, A Line in the Sand, The Alamo Diary of Lucinda Lawrence by Sherry Garland. Wednesday, September 9th, 1835. First thing I did upon awakening this morning was smell my new cedar pencils and the cover of my new diary. I still cannot believe they are mine. They arrived yesterday with the supplies, a gift from my dear grandmother Lawrence in Missouri in honor of my 13th birthday. I was engaged in school lessons at Mrs. Rowe's house when I heard the ruckus. The entire populace of little Gonzaleses spilling out of log cabins into the muddy street to greet the creaky supply wagons rolling up from the Guadalupe River Ferry. All the Texas colonies are far removed from civilization, but our DeWitt's colony is the farthest west of them all. Supplies only come twice a year, by ship from New Orleans, then overland by wagon. I could hardly stand still as I watched the men unload barrels of molasses, flour, sugar, dried apples, pots, pans, churns, irons, barrels of whiskey, tobacco, coffee, dried beans, and other sundries. Mitty Rowe almost swooned when she saw bolts of calico cloth and rolls of silk ribbon. She hankers after hair ribbons more than any girl I know. I suppose it's because she has such pretty fine hair. The fanciest ribbon in the world wouldn't help my coarse red hair. Mama says it looks like a horse's tail. The supply ship also brought mail from the States. My little brother Green ran to the fields to fetch Papa Willis and Lemuel, who were busy picking cotton. They dropped everything, for the arrival of supplies and mails is almost as grand an occasion as Christmas or the 4th of July. Besides my diary, Grandmother Lawrence's package included some milled blue cloth. The sight almost brought tears to Mama's eyes, and she ran her callous fingers over the cloth as if it were a silk wedding dress. I hear the whippoorwills in the woods. The summer heat is still with us, so my three brothers are asleep on pallets in the breezy dog trot between the two rooms of the log cabin. I am here in the dark room, lit by a candle that casts dancing shadows across the walls. Mama has washed Papa's feet in the wash pan and told me to snuff out the flame. My mind spins with thoughts of what to record in my diary, but for now I will hide the pencils in a chink in the logs near my straw pallet, and I will hold the diary close to my heart all night long. Thursday, September 10th. Very early, before leaving for the cotton fields, Willis and Lemuel argued over a whittling knife that came in Grandmother's package. They both grabbed for it and got into an awful brawl until Papa ended the fight. He took the knife and turned right around and handed it to Green, who is but nine years old and has no need of a good whittling knife yet. Willis and Lem scowled, but dared not say one word to Papa about his system of discipline. After supper tonight, Papa saw me writing in my new diary and said so much reading and writing can't be good for a girl and that I should pay more attention to my chores and learn how to sew and cook or else I won't get a good husband. Mama's back straightened, and she clutched the iron poker. Says she, Ain't nary a thirteen-year-old girl west of the Mississippi can sew straighter stitches or cook better than our Lucinda, Mr. Lawrence. Her chores is always done right proper. I don't reckon a bit of book learning will cause her harm. When Papa saw the look on Mama's face, he put his pipe down and said, Why, I do believe Mrs. Lawrence is riled. Papa didn't say another word about my schooling after that. Friday, September 11th. Mrs. Rowe received a slate board and a box of slate pencils in the supplies. They are the first I've ever seen. Mrs. Rowe is Mama's second cousin and one of the few educated women in the colony. Most are like Mama, unable to read or write. Mrs. Rowe teaches a few students in her house or under a live oak tree when it's hot. The older boys are all picking cotton now. So it's only me, Mitty, Green, and the younger Rowe children. We have no money, for the cotton has not been sold yet. So we pay her with what we can, eggs, melons, or fresh honey that Lem finds in the woods. Mitty's father, Thomas Rowe, owns a broom-making shop and also makes furniture. But he is in Louisiana now, been gone for five weeks. Rumors say he ran off for good. 
Every time someone mentions him, Mitty clams up and changes the subject. It's a mile walk from our farm to the row house on Water Street, but it's worth the trouble, for I love learning. And Mitty is my best friend. She is 14 and knows more about fashions and parties than any girl in these parts. She taught me all the dance steps I know. She dragged me to the dance at the 4th of July celebration and loaned me her best bonnet. Though, I must say, lately she has been acting peculiar. She used to be so much fun, always up thinking up interesting things to do, but these rumors are bothering her. Saturday, September 12th. No lessons today. I saw Mitty coming down the path through the woods that passes behind Mama's vegetable garden full of pumpkins and melons and sweet potatoes. Mama says Mitty and I are as different as night and day. That's because I am tall as a pine tree and all legs. I'm always stumbling over my own big feet. My thick red hair hangs down my back in a single flat plate no matter what the occasion. Mitty is small and graceful as a swan. Her hair is the color of dark honey and she studies fashion plates in ladies' magazines to learn different ways to style her hair. Mitty sings like an angel. I can't carry a tune. And she would not be caught dead climbing a tree. But Mama is wrong. Mitty and I do have some things in common. We both love flowers passionately and spend hours picking them, especially in the spring when the hills and prairies are blanketed with wild flowers of every color of the rainbow. When I saw Mitty today, she was carrying an armful of yellow sunflowers. I watched her place them at the memorial behind the smokehouse where there is a circle of stones and a wooden cross that marks the grave of my baby sister, Mary. The grave is empty. Mary died of a fever in Mama's arms on our two-week voyage by schooner from New Orleans to Texas and was buried at sea. She was two years old. That journey was horrible. Mary was already sick from traveling down the Missouri River by flatboat, then down the Mississippi by steamboat. Green and I spent all our days and nights with our heads hung over the rail, retching into the Gulf of Mexico. We near starved, and even Mama, as big-hipped as she is, looked like a scarecrow. First thing Papa did once we had staked our land and built our cabin was make the cross and arrange the stones as a memorial so Mama would have some place to grieve. I can hardly recall what Mary looked like, but the sight of the cross keeps her in my thoughts most every day. Sunday, September 13th. Two more chickens were missing this morning, one of our best laying hen. Lem says the footprints in the mud outside the barn belong to a panther. The Sabbath is our only day of rest. Mama doesn't cook, so we ate cold cornbread and cold ham for breakfast. Lem's pet raccoon, Bandit, got its paw chewed up in a trap, so he solved and bandaged it. Papa got mad, saying it was a waste of medicine needed for humans and livestock, not a useless critter like a raccoon. Lemuel took Bandit and hid up in a tall pecan tree, his favorite place when he gets fussed at by Papa. Lem is fifteen and a smudgeon too old to be acting like that. Sometimes I think he is half critter himself. He stutters just like a squirrel when he tries to talk. Papa's canvas sack is looking tattered, so he asked Mama to patch it. When he suggested she use the new blue cloth Grandmother Lauren set, Mama got boiling mad. Doesn't Papa know how precious a piece of cloth is to Mama? She hasn't had a new dress in a year, and her bonnet is droopy. Every time we harvest cotton, Mama puts aside some to spin into thread and weave into rough homespin on Mrs. Rowe's loom. But all that goes into making shirts for the men folks or a dress for me. Poor Mama never has anything left for herself. Monday, September 14th. Wash day. We're so low on lye soap, Mama is afraid we'll run out before hog killing time. Papa has promised that he will render a cup of hogs as soon as the cotton's all been picked and the weather turns cold. Green did the most disgusting thing today. While the water in the iron cauldron was boiling, before Mama had put in the soap and dirty clothes and stirred them with her paddle, Green tossed in a bullfrog. It hopped like crazy, but was dead and cooked before Mama could fish it out. I cried, and Green laughed. Mama took a few swings at him, but he ducked and ran. 
Well, frog legs is eatable, you know, Mama said as she put the pitiful creature on a metal plate. I reckon this will be green supper tonight. And it was. She made him eat those big old legs. He grinned and said they tasted better than chicken. But I don't think he'll do that again. Thursday, September 15th. Iron clones and linens all day. I complained about having to constantly reheat our five irons in the fire until Mama reminded me there are some who only have one iron. Papa's pants were intolerably wrinkled, and I couldn't smooth them out, so Mama took over. Her arms are so strong you can almost see the muscles through her sleeves. Mama decided to rip up some old mattress ticking to patch Papa's sack. I climbed up the ladder and got the old mattress down from the loft above the dog trot. My biggest fear in the world, besides Comanche raids and rattlesnakes, is black widow spiders, which have the nasty habit of hiding in what you store up there. Sure enough, when I shook out the mattress, two spiders ran across the floor. Green smashed them dead with his bare feet. What a little savage. It is late evening, my favorite time. Just me and my diary. Everyone is asleep and the distant howling wolves sound so lonely. But I do not mind the solitude, for I have my thoughts to keep me company. Wednesday, September 16th. A man from San Felipe in Austin's colony rode through town today. San Felipe is over a hundred miles northeast of here on the Brazos River and is the hub of the Texas colonies. It even has a printing press. The rider dropped off letters and a stack of the Telegraph and Texas Register newspaper. How I love reading those wrinkled, inky smelling pages. Received a letter from Mama's brother Henry who lives with his wife Nancy and five children in San Felipe. Uncle Henry has decided to move to DeWitt's colony next spring. When Papa heard the news, he didn't say a word. He just walked out onto the gallery and washed his face. Papa's never admitted it out loud, but I don't think he likes Uncle Henry much. It's because of politics. Uncle Henry belongs to the war party. He wants Texas to declare her independence from Mexico. Papa belongs to the Peace Party. He wants Texas to stay part of Mexico and urge a democratic constitution. Papa hates war. He says he saw enough killing in the War of 1812, serving under Andrew Jackson, who is now President of the United States. Later that day. After supper, Papa looked up from the newspaper and said, It's just a handful of slick lawyers and full agitators causing all this talk about war. Most of the colonists are farmers like me who want to live their lives and raise their families and not get involved in politics. Says Willis, I've heard there are 30,000 Americans settled in Texas now and only 4,000 Mexicans. If this were a democracy, the majority would rule. But this isn't America, it's Mexico, and Texans have no say in government affairs. That ain't right. Willis is just 17, but he talks like he knows everything. Says Papa, the Mexican army is one of the biggest in the world. Even if the Texans fought a war and won, it would be a costly victory. Willis jumped up from the table and said, But Papa, we can't just stand by and give up our freedoms. Grandpa Lawrence fought in the American Revolution, didn't he? And you fought the British at Horseshoe Bend. When it comes my time to fight for freedom, I'll not turn my back. Papa shook his head as Willis left the room. Mama looked up from poking the fire logs and said, Now don't those words sound mighty familiar, Mr. Lawrence? I recollect you getting all fired up 29 years ago and running off to join the Georgia Volunteers. Papa snorted, then got quiet, lost in his memories. Thursday, September 17th. Talk of war has been going on all summer. Sometimes it scares me, but I think it is just talk. I don't believe war will really come. We are American-born, but now we are Mexican citizens, for Texas is part of the Republic of Mexico. We came for the fertile, cheap land and the chance to farm and make a decent living. Those early times were hard. Some gave up, but not Papa. He says our roots are sunk too deep into Texas soil to pull up now. I think the worst is behind us, and only good looms on the horizon. Our cotton crop is the grandest we've ever had. 
The town is growing, and a schoolhouse is being built next spring. And the land is so unspoiled and beautiful. Sometimes my heart fills up with so much joy and freedom. I have to whoop and run across the parry like a wild mustang. I pray we never, never leave this place. Friday, September 18th. Len came in toting an oozing slab of golden honeycomb. I carried a crock full of the honey to Mrs. Rowe as payment for school lessons. She was sewing Mitty a new dress, made from one of her old ones. That makes four for Mitty. I only have two dresses, and both are plain as dirt. Of a sudden, Mitty hands me a blue bundle and says, I thought you might want this old dress of mine. Your mama can make you a, sh a skirt or a shirt for green from it. My mouth dropped when I saw the familiar dress and I cried out, But Mitty, it's the blue calico, your papa's favorite. He always says you look pretty as a blue cornflower, remember? I pushed the dress back into her hands. Well, Papa isn't ever going to see it again, is he? She threw the dress on the floor, then burst into tears and climbed up the ladder to the top floor where she sleeps. I must remember not to mention her father again. After supper tonight, Papa said he would take the day off tomorrow to cut some trees in the woods so the logs will be cured by the time Uncle Henry arrives in the spring. We will have a house raising then and, afterwards, food and music and dancing. It is about the only amusement we ever have. Saturday, September 19th. A horrible, horrible day. My fingers still tremble as I write. Papa drove to the woods to cut logs for Uncle Henry's cabin. Willis was off hunting geese with his best friend, Galba Fuqua. Around noon, as Green and I took Papa his lunch, we heard an awful scream. I thought it was Indians, but next thing I knew, a panther leaped at the ox. The ox went crazy and knocked Papa to the ground, then thrashed around. The reins wrapped around Papa and pinned him against a tree. Green ran to get Mama and Lem. The ox was so scared and confused, suddenly it turned on Papa and gored him in his thigh and side. It made me sick to see Papa's blood coming through his pants and shirt. I was about to club the ox on the head with a tree limb when I heard Mama shout for me to step aside. I turned and saw her aiming Papa's old Kentucky rifle. A loud boom shook the air, and smoke and fire spat out of the barrel. The ox dropped to its knees, then kneeled over, trembling in pain. Mama reloaded the gun and shot the poor animal dead to put it out of its misery. We cut the reins with Green's new whittling knife. Willis and Galba, having heard the shots, ran up and helped us get Papa to the house. I stood in the yard while Dr. Pollard cut off Papa's pants and shirt and washed the wounds, then wrapped them up. Papa shouted with pain. Mama told me and Green to fetch more water for the kettle over the hearth, and then she told Willis and Lem to slaughter the ox and bring the meat to the house, as there was no point in wasting beef. Lem said if Papa died, he was not going to eat one bite of the beef, no matter how hungry he was. It's late now, and my brothers are snoring like it has been an ordinary day. Mama is still awake, sitting beside Papa, washing his face. His fever is fierce, and the doctor says the next few days will de determine if he lives or dies. Sunday, September 20th. Papa's fever is still high, and he cries out, Cotton! Cotton! in his delirium. Mapa, Mama did not sleep all night. Her eyes are swollen and lined with dark circles. I milked the cow and gathered eggs, then cooked breakfast. Mama didn't eat more than two bites, but drank a whole pot of coffee. My brothers gave up their coffee for her. I thought that was sweet of them. Mama asked me to read the latest newspaper aloud to Papa though he is unconscious. The telegraph in Texas Register is full of talk of war. The Mexican president, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, has declared all Texan dissidents to be traitors to Mexico and vows to drive out all those squatters who have come to Texas illegally. Thousands of them. Texan settlements are forming militias to protect the colonists from Mexican soldiers. While I read, Mama sat in the rocking chair and fell asleep. How I wish Papa would snore or grumble when I read about the young lawyer, William Travis, who had agitated the Mexicans back in June at Anahuac. 
The ruckus almost caused a war right then and there. But Papa is quiet, except for heavy, painful breathing. The wet rag had slipped from his forehead. I must put this diary aside and get more water from the bucket. Monday, September 21st. Papa's fever broke this eve. I was reading about some Texans who captured a Mexican schooner sent to collect duties. Papa blinked and said, Galder Ned Fool's gonna get us all killed. I threw my arms around him and made so much commotion, Mama woke up and jumped out of her rocking chair. The rocker caught the cat by the tail, and you never heard such a racket. My brothers all came running up to the bed like they were ready to fight Comanche. The hound dogs commenced to yelping. The pigs under the house commenced to squealing. And the mules commenced to braying until you'd think it was the end of the world. Papa said, "'What in thunderation is all that racket, Mrs. Lawrence?' Mama said, "'It's your welcoming committee, Mr. Lawrence.' Then she smiled. Thursday, September 22nd. After supper, before the mosquitoes got bad, we helped Papa out to the front porch, and I read more of the newspaper to all. Mama rocked and sewed. Papa smoked his pipe, and the boys whittled. At that moment, I don't think Papa was sorry I knew how to read and write. I was reading an editorial about how cruel and unjust General Santa Anna is, when Green suddenly barked out, Why does everybody hate old Santa Anna so much anyhow? Willis stood and says, He's a dictator, that's why. Then Willis explained all the grievances that the Texans had against Santa Anna, like abolishing the Constitution of 1824 and sending soldiers to collect taxes. After Willis finished, Papa laughed and says, Maybe if the Texans would obey the laws they said they would, the Mexican government wouldn't have to send soldiers here. Every time Willis named a complaint, Papa had an excuse for Mexico. Pretty soon Willis got flustered. His face turned red and he ran his fingers through his mop of rusty hair. He drew in a deep breath, then says, Well, old General Santa Anna lives like a king and wastes everybody's tax money. He has a saddle of gold, and I hear he has a sword that costs $7,000. Why, you could buy half of Texas for that. They say when he's on a war campaign, he sleeps in a silk tent and drinks from a fancy silver teapot with fancy china, while as many beans. Brings young women into his tent, though he's got a wife back in Veracruz. Brings along roosters for cockfights every night, and pays more for a single fighting rooster than a Texan pays for a horse. He's an opium addict, and... And he uses a silver chamber pot. We busted out laughing. Even Mama, who doesn't allow such talk in the house. Papa laughed so hard his eyes teared up. You've got me there, son. Now there's a good reason if ever I heard one for going to war. The man uses a silver chamber pot. Wednesday, September 23rd. Willis's friend Galba came over for supper. He is 16 and so very fine and handsome. My heart pounds like a drum whenever he comes near, but he thinks of me like a little sister. He yanked my pigtail, then made faces while I was reading the last of the newspaper. I giggled until Papa shot a glance that wilted my toes. I read that Santa Anna had sent soldiers to San Antonio de Baxar, a Mexican town about 75 miles west of here, and had garrisoned them in an old Spanish mission called the Alamo. Mama had a worried look. Her youngest brother, Isaac, lives in San Antonio, where he owns a store. His pretty wife, Esperanza, is expecting her first child in the spring. She is Mexican and extremely kind. She taught me some Spanish when I last saw her. Lastly, I read that Stephen F. Austin, a peace party leader and the most respected man in Texas, had been released after almost two years of unjust imprisonment in a Mexican jail. Mr. Austin was the first man to bring American settlers into Texas. Over 1,000 attended a party in his honor. I'll bet it was a grand thing to see. If we do not have a party soon, I am afraid I will forget all the dance steps Mitty taught me. Mr. Austin, who has always believed in, a strict, in strictly obeying the laws in Mexico, now vows that war is the only recourse. There is to be a convention in San Felipe in mid-October, with representatives sent from all the major settlements. Well, it's about time Austin came to his senses, Galba said. I'm sick of Santa Anna and his dictator ways. For you know it, we'll all be his slaves. 
Papa tapped his pipe on the porch rail loudly. Galba got quiet, then put on his hat and said he had to go. Willis left with him. Papa stood up and muttered, Dern fool agitators are going to get us all killed. Those causing the biggest stink don't live 75 miles from the Mexicans like we do. They have two or three rivers twixt them and the soldiers at San Antonio. If war comes, Gonzales will be the first town to burn. Papa's words chilled my soul. Even now I cannot get them out of my mind. Thursday, September 24th. Cotton, cotton. How I hate picking cotton. Last night, Willis and Lem complained that they could not possibly pick all the cotton by themselves, with Papa being too hurt to work. So Mama volunteered herself, me, and Green. We worked from dawn until afternoon. Then me and Mama left to cook supper. My fingers are pricked and bleeding from hitting the sharp brown holes. Some folks pull the boil, hull it and all. It's faster, but pick cotton gets a higher price. Friday, September 25th. This afternoon after picking, Willis saw my hands and shouted, Sweet Jericho, you look like you've been chewed by a bear. I'm going to march you to town and buy some ointment and get you some gloves. When I asked him where he was going to get the money, he just said, Never you mind. We went to Miller's General Store, and I heard Willis negotiating to do work in exchange for the ointment. I was looking at gloves when suddenly Green came running down the street, blithering like an idiot and shouting to everyone he saw, Mexican soldiers across the river. They've got guns. Men dropped what they were doing, grabbed their rifles and hurried to the river with women and children following behind. I saw four Mexican soldiers in bright red and blue uniforms, an ox cart and a driver. The Mexican leader ordered Andrew Ponton, who was the Alca called our town's mayor to send the ferry across the river, but he refused. So a soldier had to swim the river with a written message. Word spread like wildfire that the message was from the Mexican general at San Antonio. He was requesting that Gonzales return the little six-pounder cannon that Mexico had loaned us four years ago as protection during Indian attacks. Everyone in Gonzales knows the little cannon is broken and useless as a weapon of war, but it makes a boom that scares off the Comanche. The Alcald called an emergency meeting, and the town council decided it best for the men to get the women and children safely out of town, then come back and fight if necessary. The Alcald dispatched the messengers to spread the word to the rest of the Texan settlements and to ask for volunteers to come to our aid. Eighteen men agreed to stay behind and guard the ferry. As we headed home, Green grabbed my sleeve and said, Are the Mexicans going to kill us all? Willis said, Don't worry. Our 18 men against their five is pretty good odds. His words reassured Green. But I must say pretty soon the town was busting with so much activity and panic that it was hard to stay calm. Later, when we told Papa what was happening, he nodded his eyes brows and says, That little six-pounder? Why, it can't even shoot a cannonball, even if we had one to load in it. Willis crammed his hat on his head and says, Santa Ana doesn't really need that cannon. He just doesn't want us to have any weapons. This is the beginning of disarming the colonies. If we give up the cannon, next thing you know, Santa Ana will want our hunting rifles, then our pistols, then our bowie knives, then our whittling knives. Green gasped. Old Santa Ana isn't going to get my new whittling knife. He took it out of his pocket and headed toward the door, shouting, I'm fixing to bury my life, just like they're burying the cannon in Mr. Davis's peach orchard. The words were hardly out of Green's mouth when Mitty Rowe came running up. We're heading for the river, Bob, where it'll be safer. The Mexican army is on its way. Ma says, can she drive our wagon alongside yours? Five soldiers is hardly the Mexican army, Papa said. But Mitty stood her ground. Says she, all the towns leaving for the woods and river bottoms. There's going to be a scrape for sure. The alcohol says we'll never surrender up that cannon. If the general wants it, he'll have to come and take it. Mama's eyes clouded with worry, but she turned back to Papa. I don't imagine the Mexicans will care about an old woman like me. I'll stay here with Mr. Lawrence. But Cinda, you pack up some food for yourself and your brothers. Lem, take the milk calendar calf. Willis, hitch up the mules to the wagon. 
right alongside the rose and watch over them. Nobody argues with Mama when she has that tone of voice. Saturday, September 26th. I packed cold cornbread, ham, and five baked potatoes that had been cooking in hot coals all night. Mama loaded her most prized possessions onto the wagon. A mantel clock, her best quilts, and her spinning wheel. Lemuel put a laid rope on the cow, and her calf followed behind, bawling pitifully. Willis cleaned the Kentucky rifle and filled his powder horn. Papa loaded his pistol. Just before we left, Mama took me aside. Her chin quivered, but she wasn't crying as she tied my bonnet strap. She said, Be strong, Cinda. Watch over Green. If anything happens to me and Papa, you'll be the woman of the family. Raise him right. She hugged me tight. It was not until that moment that I realized I might never see her or Papa again. Panic filled my heart. Try as I might, I couldn't stop the tears from filling my eyes. I wanted to stay with Mama, but I had to be strong. So I took Green by the hand and put him in the wagon. I think Willis would have rather been guarding the ferry than taking care of women and children. But he took his responsibility and watched over us like a mother hen. Our wagon reached the woods before sunset. We are now camped within sight of the Guadalupe River, several miles upstream from the town. The ground is wet from a recent rain, and we are devoured by mosquitoes. Every inch of exposed flesh is an itching eruption of bumps. Mitty's youngest sister, Permelia, cries and scratches endlessly. It is almost dark, so I must close. We can't make a fire because the Mexicans might see us. I wish Mitty could sleep in our wagon, but she must help watch over the children. I know I will not sleep. The mosquitoes, the hoot owls, the wind moaning, the wolves, and the thought of snakes slithering into our camp will make it impossible for me to close my eyes. I cannot bear to think of Mama and Papa all alone. Sunday, September 27th. It does not seem like Sunday without Mama here. Every Sunday I comb her long red hair that reaches the floor, and after she twists it up on her head, we go to the front porch and I read from the Bible. Usually the rows come over and we sing hymns. This morning, after breakfast, Mrs. Rowe got out her Bible. Says she, I hear that a traveling Methodist preacher is in the area. I reckon he'll rake in a bushel of sinners like he did at that last camp revival. Lordy, those Methodists do get all fired up. We laugh, for we are Baptists. That revival was two years ago. Just about every child old enough to walk lined up and got baptized in the icy Guadalupe River. Folks came from farms and far-out settlements and camped out for three days. Men killed beeves and women barbecued them out under the oak trees. Folks ate and sang and clapped and played fiddles and repented. And I must confess, there were a few bottles of corn liquor being passed behind the bushes. Protestant ministers are not supposed to preach in Mexican territory. All the American colonists who come to Texas swore to become Catholics, but I've only seen a Catholic priest once in five years. He performed marriages and baptized anyone who was not a Catholic. So I got sprinkled by the Catholics to please the Mexican government and dunked by the Protestants to please Mama. I suppose my soul is in good shape now. Monday, September 28th. Mitty and I walked to the river for water and she swore she saw an Indian or a Mexican soldier behind every bush, and we jumped at every little noise. Finally, she said, Let's sing hymns to take our minds off our worries. Mitty has the loveliest voice on earth. I didn't feel like singing, but I agreed, for I knew it would lift her spirits. Later, Lem told me our voices carried through the woods, and if the Mex Mexicans didn't know where we were before, they surely did now. I didn't have the heart to tell Mitty what he said. Two other families joined us today. Thank the Lord. Willis says if there is no word by morning, he will return to town and investigate. Lemuel saw some honeybees and took off. When he came back, he had a leather pouch filled with honeycomb. Bandit the raccoon was sitting on his shoulder, licking his sticky paws. Mrs. Rowe is giving us school lessons to pass the time. I memorized a sonnet. Oh, these mosquitoes are feasting again. Papa told me once that 
Karankawa Indians smear alligator grease over their bodies to keep away mosquitoes. Smelly though it is, I understand why, if it keeps those flying demons away. How I miss my bed and the warm fire. Most of all, I miss Mama and Papa. Tuesday, September 29th. Right after sunrise, we heard loud hoofbeats. It was Texans from settlements north and east of here, on their way to help Gonzales. Familiar Gonzales men were also returning after getting their families to safety. Willis whooped and said he was going to join them, for he figured there was going to be a big scrape and he didn't want to be left out. Lem, who has no stomach for fighting and killing, said he would stay and watch over me in green. Willis thanked him sincerely and told us not to return to town until it was all clear. There is a little fort there, but we rarely use it any more. Men passed by all morning on their way to defend that pitiful cannon. When one big bear-looking man rode by, Mrs. Rowe says, I guess those men will be rooting around for whatever food they can find in our houses and gardens. Another woman sighed and says, Well, there goes my potato patch. Then Mitty says, there goes the hen eggs. Then another one says, There goes my snuff. I knowed I should have brung it with me. We all laughed our heads off. I wonder if Papa is out of bed yet. I hope he doesn't do anything foolish. Just before he left, he tried to stand up and reopened his wound, bloodying his shirt. Papa is one of the best marksmen in the colony. He'll defend Mama with his last drop of blood. But I pray he won't have to. Wednesday, September 30th. I write hastily by the light of the moon as I sit in the back of the wagon. Lemuel snuck off at dawn to find out what was going on in town. When he came back, thrashing through the bushes, it was a miracle that Mrs. Rowe didn't clobber him with her axe. Lem reported that on Monday the Texans had crossed the river and captured four of the five Mexicans. Tuesday, a Mexican lieutenant showed up across the river with 100 dragoons. The ferry and all the boats were on his side, so they couldn't get across. The lieutenant asked for an interview with the Alcald, but the 18 men guarding the ferry informed him Mr. Ponton was out of town. Wednesday, some townspeople finally met with the Mexicans and explained we weren't going to give up that cannon because it was needed for protection from the Indians. The Mexicans left. Lem figures they are going up the river to look for a shallow place to ford, and then coming back toward the town on this side and were right in their path. At that news, Mitty gasped, and Mrs. Rowe's face turned white. Lem broke up camp, and we headed back home. We figure it's safer there than in the woods. I can't wait to see Mama and Papa.